Hi everybody, welcome to another isolated WF repair video. I've been convinced again to repair amateur radio stuff. This is a Yeso FT817 all bands, all mod portable transceiver. This one has internal batteries and it's just dead. It does not power up as you can see. After removing a few screws, the top cover can be lifted. And we need to unplug the speaker connector. Most components are of course SMD, so I need proper magnifying glasses again. This PCB is called the main unit. And this flat cable connects to the front panel and the CPU unit. Of course, it would be impossible to attempt a repair without a service manual, but luckily it's available for download. A link to it is in this video description. The first thing we notice on the schematic is a fuse right at the battery input on the main unit. So this is the first thing I'm going to check. Mm, and we have no continuity on this little SMD fuse. Of course, a fuse usually does blow for a reason, so I want to check that there is no short circuit to ground after the fuse. But no, there is no low resistance here. So I've just soldered a temporary small fuse with the correct readings. But it still looks dead. However, now the battery voltage is present on the main unit. While checking again all voltages on the battery connector, I've realized that pin 5 measures 0 volts. This signal only gives some feedback to the battery charging circuit, as far as I can tell, but I need to investigate what's wrong anyway. If we look at the board interconnection diagram, we learn that pin 5 is just set up to half the battery voltage, so it should be easy to troubleshoot. I opened the battery cover. These are normal AA rechargeable batteries, it seems. And the green wire is just unsoldered, which is weird. And so I've just soldered it back. For the moment, while testing, the battery holder can stay outside its compartment. Of course, as expected, it doesn't not power up yet. But, as before, we can measure the full battery voltage. And now also the half battery voltage on the connector. When I told the owner of this radio about the disconnected green wire, he actually told me that that was intentional and explained that it's needed to allow the radio to charge the batteries when using the double A battery holder. Well, let's look at the circuit again then. When the green wire is connected, as we have seen, it has half the pack voltage, which is 4 cells. If they are rechargeable batteries, that would be more than 4.8 volts when fully charged, and when not rechargeable batteries, it will be higher than that, 
With the 330 kilo ohms and 100 kilo ohms base resistor divider, any voltage higher than about 3 volts will turn Q1107 on. Q1106 then will instead turn off because its base will see a too low voltage through one diode inside the D1082 package. When Q1106 is off, also Q1102 will be off since its base current has no path to flow to. This transistor provides a trickle charge current to the battery whenever the external power supply is connected to the radio. The value of the trickle charging current can be calculated by looking at R1436 value. With about 15 mA flowing on this resistor, Q1105 will start turning on and limit Q1102 base current. But now, a very similar charging circuit can be enabled by the CPU signal CHG. When that goes high, Q1099 turns on, and that also turns on Q1101, which can source up to 150 mA to the battery. However, the CPU also knows that the green wire is connected because one of its inputs, called BATT, sees the low logic level through the other diode contained on D1082 and it will hopefully refuse to raise CHG output. A nice design, don't you think? Now, since we have the supply voltage present on the main unit, the next thing to check is the power on signal that enables the supply to reach most of the other circuits. This signal is generated, however, by the main CPU that lives in the panel unit, which is a small PCB located in the front assembly together with the LCD and the various buttons and controls. But the first thing I've noticed when starting disassembling the front assembly is the bulging capacitor. This is not a good thing and I'll need to substitute it before doing anything else. And to remove the PCB from the front panel we need to remove one screw, most of the knobs and the rotary encoder. It takes some time and patience. The bulging electrolytic is just near the power button, so after removing it I need to check that the switch makes proper contact and no leakage from the capacitor damaged it. After all, there was almost no leakage, so I've cleaned the area with the isopropyl alcohol and installed a replacement capacitor, and of course tested the switch and confirmed it makes a proper contact when pressed. I've then checked with my ESR meter all the remaining electrolytic capacitors on this PCB, and this small SMD1 showed almost as an open circuit, so this is also bad. The old electrolytic capacitor has been substituted with this tantalum SMD capacitor, that has the same ratings and a similar footprint. This one will be more reliable than the original. However, the radio still does not power on. Now, let's get back to the missing power on signal. This is the main microcontroller of this transceiver, and the power on signal is generated directly by one of its output pins. However, a quick check with the multimeter showed that the VCC pins on this CPU are all at zero volts. So, let's follow the power supply from where it enters this PCB. The line is labeled 13 dot bus and we checked that on the main PCB it has the full battery voltage. In the panel PCB we should find the battery voltage on Q4001 source pin then. Q001 is this rather large SMD transistor, but I've always found 0 volts on all its pins, so it means the battery voltage rail is interrupted somewhere before reaching this point. I've then checked the flat cable connecting the main PCB to the panel PCB, and it shows continuity on all pins, and then verified that the battery voltage is still present on the SMD inductor pointed by the multimeter probe here. Now, the battery voltage should also be present on the third pin from the right of this connector, but it is not, so we are close to the problem. 
The board layout on the service manual shows a trace connecting the FP1002 inductor, where the voltage is present, to the third pin from the right of the connector. It's the one marked in blue in this image. Clearly, this trace is broken somewhere under the connector. For sure, I'm not going to remove that SMD connector, so I've just added a small wire from the inductor to the third pin of the connector that should bypass the broken trace and restore the power rail to the panel PCB. So, let's try now. Yeah, welcome back! When reassembling the front panel, it is especially important to check the action of all switches. It may happen that the rubber membrane of a switch gets misplaced and the switch cannot be operated correctly. Like in this case, I have to open it again. But eventually all works fine. Let's also reconnect the speaker. It looks good. I think I'm going to test it on the air. This band sounds open. This is the Sierra Victor 5 beacon. Sugar Victor 1, Juliet Delta, Zulu, this is India, Zulu 8, Delta, Whiskey, Fox Rot, Italy, Zulu 8, Delta, Whiskey, Fox Rot, over. Italy, Zulu 8, Delta, Whiskey, Fox Rot, correct? Yes, correct, India, Zulu 8, Delta, Whiskey, Fox Rot, stroke QRP, over. Italy, Zulu 8, Delta, Whiskey, Fox Rot, very good morning. You are 5 by 757, your Santiago report. Victor 1, Juliet Delta Zulu, and my name is Panos Lake Papa Alpha, November Oscar Sierra Panos QSL. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Panos, very good copy here. Uh, 59 plus, 59 plus. My name is Frank Foxtrot, Romeo Alpha, November Kilo, and my locator Juliet Mike 87 Alpha Whiskey. Juliet Mike 87 Alpha Whiskey, over. QSL, Roger, Roger, very good copy, Panos. Uh, uh, many thanks for the QSO and uh, thank you for answering me. I'm uh, working with 5 watt in this moment. 73, Panos, uh, thank you again. Thank you, 73.